Hello, everyone. This is Ray Savage with Cambium Networks. Uh, thanks for joining this evening session of Cambium College, uh, where we'll be describing how to go through the steps of actually planning a wireless broadband link and uh, how you can plan the network using some of our uh, free software tools. Uh, the presentation is being recorded tonight, so it'll be available on the community uh, for replay. And uh, But during the course of the presentation, if you do have any questions, and, and we'd love to hear, uh, hear from you, just use the uh, question and answer dialog box on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll be able to answer your questions during, uh, during the presentation live. Well, tonight's presenter is uh, David Hensley, who has uh, spent his career uh, working in wireless broadband and high technology. He is a senior engineer of networks and systems at Cambia Networks and has done quite a number of uh, link planning projects in his career. Uh, Dave, we're glad to have you with us. Thanks, Ray. So, uh, first of all, I am not in presentation mode because I'm going to be switching back and forth between Google Earth, PowerPoint, and link planner. So that's why I'm not uh, showing, you know, you can see the slides here. I just apologize in advance. Uh, we're going to do a quick uh, link budget review. For those of you who have been uh, watching the Cambium College presentations, I thank you. And if you need a quick review or if you need a, a more in-depth review of what a link budget is, you should go back and look at the presentation that I did on April the 4th. That was for uh, propagation, and the final output of that or, or outcome of that talk was uh, a link budget and how to create one. And we're going to review that today. Uh, I'm going to show you where to find Google Earth, where to find Link Planner, and then I'm going to step back and say, wait, what are we really trying to do here? You know, tie all those things together. Then I am going to create a link for you. And then we're going to explore some relationships because life is full of trade-offs. And I'm going to show you the trade-offs that you can examine using Link Planner. Uh, we're going to talk about network topologies and uh, how that will affect your network. And then I'll give you um, uh, some, some ideas to go off and study further. This is designed to kind of whet your appetite and give you like a jump start. It's really hard to dive into something with, you know, unless you see somebody doing it. And then once you see them do it, you, you, you know, the light bulb goes off and you say, oh, that's how that works. And then that kind of energizes you and, and gives you uh, some ideas to go out and try for yourself. So that's really what I'm trying to do here today. Here is a review of a link budget. And whoa. It's not a budget in the formal sense, you know, dollars and cents. It's, it's a, a radio power budget. Um, let me skip ahead a little bit and say what we are trying to do is, to, is provide as much power as we can to the, uh, the receiver. And we're trying to connect point A to point B. And if you can imagine a transmitter at point A and a receiver at point B, we've got to get that transmitter to yell loudly enough so that the receiver can hear the transmitter, so that B can hear A. And it actually works both ways. You have to have B talking loudly enough so that A can hear them. And what I've drawn down here on the lower right is the radio channel. And there's some input information. There's lots of things that happen in the transmitter. Um, the signal is, goes over a transmit antenna. It travels through the RF channel. That's not like a radio channel or a TV channel or a Wi-Fi channel. It, it shares some similarities, but really what I'm talking about is free space. In other words, it's not, a, uh, it's not something that you can dial up per se. The receiver then is shown with the receiver antenna connected to it, and then we get some output information. So what's in a link budget? Well, we're looking to maximize the received power, and we're representing that by P sub R, or PR, in the, the lower left. So that power received is equal to the power that's transmitted by the transmitter, but 
there's an antenna there and that antenna focuses the energy and increases the power. So that's a gain. And then when it travels through free space, uh, through the RF channel, the radio frequency channel, there is some loss, there's some attenuation. And so we call that free space path loss. We have to subtract power uh, when, it, when it goes through that channel. And then the receiver antenna uh, acts as an amplifier and it increases the signal. And so it's the power transmitted plus the gain of the transmit antenna minus the free space path loss plus the gain of the receiver. So that's what your received power is gonna look like. And what I have in this chart is a link budget for a Wi-Fi frequency, 2.4 gigahertz. And what I'm gonna do is vary the distance between the access point antenna and the client antenna. And I'm gonna vary it from 10 meters to 1,000 meters. And uh, the frequency is 2.4 gigahertz. As you might remember uh, from our discussion last time, the, the frequency uh, will have a great effect on the, uh, the free space path loss. And I will show you that in Link Planner as well in case you've forgotten. So you can see the transmit power is listed there. Now it's listed in units uh, called dBm. And what that is, is that's dBs or decibels above a milliwatt. So we measure power in watts, just like your light bulb is probably 60 watts or maybe it's five watts, maybe it's an LED bulb. Uh, we measure RF power, uh, at least on our products, uh, because they're typically pretty low power. We measure them in decibels above a milliwatt or dBm. The next thing you see there is the uh, transmitter antenna gain. And we measure that in uh, decibels uh, relative to an isotropic radiator. And you don't need to worry about that. Um, just remember that it's, it's DBI and that allows you to add and subtract using the same units. The free space path loss is listed here. And you can see that um, as I get farther and farther away from the access point, my client has a lot more free space path loss. So here at 10 meters, it's only 60 dB, but at a kilometer or a thousand meters, it's 100 dB. So that's quite a, that's a lot more loss. Now my client antenna is typically not a very big antenna. So I've given it a gain of zero. And all that means is that it doesn't really add or take away anything from the signal. It has a unity gain, in other words. So you can see the received power 10 meters away is uh, minus 42 dBm, which is really relatively high power. Uh, and it drops all the way down to minus 82 dBm at 1,000 meters. And so this is just an example, again, showing you what happens to my received power as the access Point and the client get farther and farther apart. Well, you know, spreadsheets are great, uh, but sometimes they can be cumbersome. And if you're trying to manage a bunch of different link budgets at the same time for your network and you have a collection of these things, you don't want to have to manage a collection of spreadsheets or even a collection of columns in a spreadsheet. You, you really need a tool to do this. And um, we have a free tool that helps people do this, and it's called Link Planner. So the next part of our presentation, I'm gonna show you how to use this link budgeting concept to explore, uh, well, to plan a link and then explore some characteristics of radio links. So the next thing we need to do is we need to find Google Earth. Um, this is a, an application or a program that you can run on Oh, gee, lots of things like your smartphone or your laptop. We're going to put it on the laptop. And you should notice that uh, Google Earth Pro is now available for free. So if you want the extra features that Google Earth Pro affords, then you know, feel free to go ahead and download that and install it on your machine. The next step is to find Link Planner. And that's on our website. We've got a shortcut up there. It's just www.cambiumnetworks.com slash link planner. And uh, I should do that. I should do that right now. Let me open up a window. I'm assuming you're 
familiar with how to find Google Earth. And if I could type, that would help. Okay, so that takes you to the link planner page and you have to scroll down. Now, this is kind of tricky. It says where to buy. You don't have to buy this. That's the beautiful thing. And you go down here. Oh, look at that, download now. So you left click on that button and then download that to your machine. In fact, let's do that right now. Oh, you know what you're gonna have to do? You're gonna have to register. So you're gonna register with Cambium Networks. That's just our, you know, the customers, we try and keep track of our customers that way. We don't take a lot of information, but we just wanna keep track of you, make sure you're not a robot and all that thing. That will take you to a download page and you can load a version for your Mac or for your PC. So I'm gonna leave it at that. And well, you know what, I can take you to the support page. You go to support.cambiumnetworks.com. And go to down. Oh, see, it's going to ask me to log in again. All right. In any case, you're going to have to log in to do that. Apologies. Now, install it. The next thing you're going to do is um, is fire it up, run it. So let me do that. This is the splash screen. The first, the very first thing you're going to do. Let's go up here, tools, options, and you're gonna put your name and your phone number and your email address. Now, if you don't have a phone number, don't worry about that, but we do need your email address um, so that we can register you for a profile service, which I will talk about later. Uh, but this is the first bit of information. This will work if all you have is your name and an email address here. So that's the very first thing you need to do. Then the next thing you need to do is right here under path profile. And you need to request a new access token. And what that'll do is it'll take you to a web page, and you will uh, generate a new token by putting in your email address. And that token then, you're gonna take that token, copy it, and paste it right in here. And what that will do is that will allow you to get profile uh, profiles from us. And what's happening is we need to know, before we can tell you what the RF performance is going to be between point A and point B, we need to know what the Earth's surface looks like. Uh, for example, if there is a skyscraper or a tree or some other large object. So let's say, uh, well, past few weeks I've been working with a, a link that has a cruise ship in the middle. Cruise ships are huge, and you you know you want to make sure that, uh, especially if you're working on a microwave link, that you don't have big objects like cruise ships and semi trucks and trees and things like that in the way. So you need this to be able to do your link planning. Um, Contrary to popular belief, even though we call it free space path loss and we kind of make some assumptions that, oh yeah, this is how the signal would decrease if it were traveling through a vacuum. Well, uh, when the radio signals are traveling close to the earth from point A to point B, that's not a vacuum. And so uh, we need that information to help model it even more accurately. In any case, that's the first thing you need to do. First two things you need to do. First thing is get your personal information in there. Next thing is your path profile service. Now, your first question is, I am very security conscious. I am worried about what you are doing with my information. Please tell me what you are doing with it. We do not keep track of the types of products you're using or the bands you're using, you know, the frequencies and all those kinds of details. The only thing we know is your email address and um, where you are planning a, a link. So the type of information we get is the latitude and longitude of point A, the latitude and longitude of point B, and then the antenna heights that uh, you have chosen. And that's all, that's all we get. Okay, we send the, the path profile back to you and then you use it any way you want to. 
Um, so we're not uh, keeping track of those kinds of things. Um, what we use this for is if someone's planning a network and we think they might need some help, we will contact them um, at the phone number if it's available or the email address. And we'll say, hey, can we help you? So it's really a, a very useful, very useful service. Next thing you should note, if you are struggling this email address right here, linkplanner.ptp at cambiumnetworks.com. That email address is where you can send questions about Link Planner. So if you've struggled with something, you know, you spent five to 10 minutes trying to figure out how this thing works and you just can't get it to do what you need it to do, send an email to that address and someone will get back to you and they will help you solve your problem. Let's go back to the slide. Let's see what I have next. Okay. Did I cover that? Yes, I did. We got options, we got path profile. Okay. Now, let's back up a little bit. <laughs> what are we trying to do here? We're trying to connect point A to point B. So, uh, Surfer Boy, and I mean Internet Surfer Boy, is at point B. And Internet Surfer Boy wants to surf the Internet. That's what he does. But he doesn't have any coverage. And so what we need to do is we need to get the internet from point A where there is internet to point B where there is no internet. And we'll use a wireless link and then we'll probably connect uh, a Wi-Fi router to the end of that wireless link at point B and then Surfer, Surfer Boy will be able to surf the internet with reckless abandon. So obviously Surfer Boy needs as much throughput as possible. We're not gonna tell him that he can't watch videos, um, you know, you can't use YouTube. We're not gonna tell them that. We're gonna say, hey, we're gonna get you as much throughput as we can. We're gonna get as much bandwidth as possible to you. Now that's called throughput and it's just data rate. It's bits per second. That's how we measure it, in bits per second. And typically, let's, let me give you some typical uh, throughputs. So an email application or a web application requires Oh, 100, 200 kilobits per second, roughly speaking. Uh, a video might require uh, two to three to 500 to maybe a megabit per second, 500 kilobits to a megabit per second. Those are some typical throughputs. Are there you know, other applications that require more or less throughput? Yes, but that just kind of gives you an idea of the kind of throughput that we're looking for. Now, the other part of this is, you know, Surfer Boy doesn't want to be told, well, sorry, but you only have internet between 8 and 10 in the morning. You, no, in fact, you want this link to stay up for as long as possible. You don't ever want it to go down, ever, at all. And when we design a link like that, we call it a highly available link. And if you'd like more information about high availability, you can go to this Wikipedia page that I've listed. And you'll find, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll find this chart here. And this is how we define availability. It's a percentage of time over a, a year. And so you may have heard the term five nines availability. If you're in public safety, you should know that term, five nines availability. What does that mean? That means 99.999% of the time, a particular service is available. Well, when is it unavailable? That's what I want to know. Well, it's unavailable 5.26 minutes per year. And you can, you know, you can read the table. You can see that equates to 25.9 seconds per month, six seconds per week, or about one second per day. Now, one thing you need to remember, this is a, this is a, uh, this is a probability exercise. So this does not mean that it's down for exactly 5.26 minutes every year. It is down for exactly 26 seconds per month, six seconds per week, and exactly one second per day. That time that it's down could happen at any time uh, during that year. It could be evenly distributed throughout the year or it could happen all at once. But uh, this is one of the aspects that we talk about. And, and this is the same availability that you might have heard in, say, a Verizon commercial or an AT&T commercial talking about availability you know, and reliability. 
99.5 or 99.95 percent you can see what that translates to downtime and it might surprise you so bottom line there are two major requirements throughput bits per second and availability or downtime per year tell me how often it's going to go down because surfer boy he wants that link to stay up for as long as possible he can probably live truth be known surfer boy can probably live with a four nines link don't tell him but he could probably live with something that's down for 52 minutes a year because surfer boy probably even though he'll deny this he probably needs to sleep and so remember uh a day is not just an eight hour day, it's a 24 hour day. And he probably has to sleep during that time. So the link could go down while he's sleeping and he wouldn't even, he wouldn't know it, it wouldn't affect him. Unless say he were downloading a file overnight. In any case, how are we gonna create this link from point A to point B? I'm gonna show you what we're gonna do on this slide and then I'm actually gonna do it. And after the presentation, I would encourage you to follow these steps and do it for yourself. It's very easy and uh, it's quite enlightening. We're gonna start out with Google Earth. We're gonna add a place mark for point A and a place mark for point B. One by one, we're gonna copy those place marks into Link Planner. Then we're going to link the sites together. We're going to enter our requirements, because remember, we're trying to go for high throughput and high availability so that surfer boy can be appeased and he will stop bugging us. Um, we're gonna experiment with the, the band, the bandwidth, modulation mode, antennas, and things like that. And you'll see uh, what I mean by life is full of trade-offs. So let's, without further ado, let's go and do this. So uh, Google Earth can take a little bit of time to, to fire up. And so to save some time, I've fired it up already. And what I'm looking at right here is an area in Illinois. It's in the Chicago land area. It's in Rolling Meadows. And uh, this is the intersection of 53290 and I-90. And this happens to be where I work. This is Cambium Networks. Woohoo! So this is where the place marks are. It's like a little push pin. So I'm going to left click on that push pin. Oh, look at that. I put it real close to where I wanted it. I'm going to put it right there. Now it's untitled, so of course we have to give it a name. You know, we can't have something untitled. So how do I get that? Oh, you know what? I've got two screens here. It, it put the it put the entry for the title over on the other screen. So we're going to call this point B. Actually, no, let's call this point A. And you can see um, Google Earth has already entered the latitude longitude in there for us. And then that's going to be point A. And then Surfer Boy is going to be over here. This happens to be the birthplace of Cambium Networks. This is where Cambium Networks started out. This is the used to be the Motorola corporate headquarters. And there is an 11 or 12 story building right there. And we're going to put our other antenna on top of that building. Call it point B. Okay, so again, what did I do there? I put in my point A and point B. Let me scroll out a little bit on Google Earth. There's point A right here. There's point B. So what I'm going to do is link these two together and Surfer Boy is over there at Motorola. Okay, next step, start up link planning. And you've already seen me start it up. So let me go back to Google Earth. I'm going to select this guy. And instead of left clicking, I'm going to right click. You see how the copy comes up? So I'm going to do copy, go to Link Planner. Oh, and you know what? I have to start a new project. So let's call this project, let's just name it. Let's call it Surfer Boy. I need to paste a network site. So that's what I do later. Remember I copied point A, so I'm gonna paste it. Oh, look at that, that's point A. So this is my map. Now let me go grab point B. Copy, 
case network sites. There's point B. So I got point A and point B. And now, how do I know that that looks about right? Well, um, what Link Planner does is center that in your map area. And it looks like uh, point A is south, southeast of point B. So that's a good thing. I can look at the center of my map, which is 42 north, 88 west. So those are latitude, longitude coordinates. Um, so that looks about right. But look at this over here. I've got Google Maps built into Link Planner. So let me let me hit that. Now we've got a little problem here. Sometimes we have some some what are called application programmer interface incompatibilities. It, just pay no attention to this. Just dismiss it. See there, it goes away. And look at that. There's a map of Motorola headquarters there and Cambium Networks headquarters there. How do I know that? Well, this is 290 and this is I-90. If I switch back to Google Earth, there it is again. So I know I'm in the right place. So let me go back to LinkedIn and use my offline map. Now, the next thing I want to do is connect point A to point B. And I've got a lot of different ways I can do that. I can click this little wizard here that says new link. And I can left click on point A and, you know, left click on point B. And that tells me, you know, that, that will fire up my link. But I'm going to do it a little bit differently. So that's, that's one way, but I don't want to finish with that. What I want to do is I'm going to go up to project, new PTP link. PTP stands for point to point. I'm going to say new point to point link. And here, this is where I would connect point A to point B. And then I just hit OK. And then watch what happens here. It automatically puts the Earth's surface on this link. So what am I looking at here? Let me just expand it out a little bit. What am I looking at? So point A is here. Now remember, what was point A again? That was Cambium Networks. Point B was Motorola. So there are two things, two big things that are in the way. So what we got to do is take a look at this and see, hey, does this make sense? I've got a couple of things that are in the way. And you know that <laughs> I need to take a look at how, how tall. Uh, See, I'm only 33 feet off the ground. I'm looking at an antenna height at point B at Motorola, 33 feet. That's not right. I'm probably at something like 150 feet because I'm on an 11-story building. I might even be higher than that. Let's put it at 175. And then over here at Cambium Networks, I'm probably at 75 feet, let's say, off the ground. Because I'm going to put it on the ceiling, not the ceiling, the roof of both buildings. Now... I've still got these things that might get in the way. So let's take a look at that. Where is this? That's six tenths of a mile along the path. For those of you who are used to meters and kilometers, I apologize. This is uh, rather US centric. Uh, I, I have feet on this scale and miles on this scale. So uh, the first object is six tenths of a mile from point A. And the next object is 1.5 miles. So let's just go look at that. Now, how do I do that? Well, I could just left click on Google Earth and that, you know, that would, but, you know, then I can't really, I have to get out my ruler and measure. There's an easier way. Go back to Link Planner. See that right there? That's an Earth. And oh, if I just hover over it, it says Google Earth. What happens if I click that? Ah, oh, it flies me to the link. And it orients point A on the left and point B on the right. And then it's calibrated. So I, oh, and it's even labeled. I can see where the high point is. So let's go look at that first high point, six tenths of a mile along the link. What on earth is that? That is an IKEA store. There's an IKEA store in the way. That's what this is telling me. Okay. Now, I can tell you the IKEA store is probably not going to be a problem because it's not that tall. But, I mean, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Um, I believe that's a three-story IKEA building, and they have wonderful meatballs for lunch with the cafeteria on the top floor. The next point was about, was it 1.5 miles? Oh, look at that. That is another building, and I don't remember what that one is. 
Oh, look at that. I've, I've put point B at the wrong place. This is actually my skyscraper. This is my, my Motorola uh, corporate headquarters. This is actually um, not 175 feet. It is uh, a totally different building. I'm gonna put him at 75 and see if we've still got any issue. Let's just see. Yeah, that'll work, that'll work. We'll go with that. Let's go back to Google Earth and I'll show you. This is actually, this is what used to be called a Motorola University. This is fine though. That puts this guy in the way, perhaps. Probably not. We'll have to, we'll have to take another look at the map. For now, let's just assume he's not in the way. So what have we done so far, just to review? We have connected point A to point B. So remember, Surfer Boy is over here at uh, Galvin University, the Motorola uh, University, uh, former Motorola University location. Ikea's in the way. Motorola corporate tower's in the way. I can't believe I missed that. And then Cambium Networks is right here. That's point A. That's where our source of our internet is gonna be. And we're going over a highway, but really the biggest thing we gotta worry about is this Ikea store here and then this 11-story building here. Now, someone who does this for a living would go ahead and enter the buildings in here and get the proper heights and everything. Um, Link Planner allows you to do that. I'm not gonna cover that today. I'm just gonna say, look, I'm gonna wave my hand and say, look, we're not gonna talk about that. We're gonna assume that the link will close. Now, what does that mean? It will close. Is this like a house closing? No. Um, is it like a door closing? No, not at all. This is a close. By close, I mean, am I able to get Surfer Boy the data that he needs? If the link doesn't close, he can't get his data. And, you know, he can't use his Wi-Fi. So, I want the link to close. How do I do that? Well, let's assume that these things don't get in the way. The next thing I need to do is um, choose a frequency band. Um, what I would do if I were you is don't panic. There are lots of bands here, and I'm gonna suggest that you focus on just a few of them. There are lots of complexities here, but if you start slowly and you just work with one band, uh, you will become familiar with that band, and then you can move on to another band and see what the differences are, not to worry. One thing I forgot to tell you was that everything in Link Planner goes top to bottom and left to right. So the thing I wanna start out with is at the very top and the very left, and that's the band. Let's start out with something that's in an unlicensed band. Um, this is actually where five gigahertz Wi-Fi occurs. It is, it is a good starting point, 5.8 gigahertz. Let's leave the product at PTP 650. This is a high performance, unlicensed 5.8 point-to-point uh, -point link product. We're gonna leave the capacity at full. You can see that you can change that. Um, the link is in the United States, so the regulation we're gonna use is the United States. Leave the rest of this alone. You don't really need to worry too much about this. All I wanna do right now is show you how to get the link to close. Now, remember this, I can move up and down to you know take a detailed look at the at the, uh, the path profile. I don't really need to do that right now, so I'm gonna move it up a little bit. Here is where I get to have fun with antennas. So right here under configuration at each end is where I select antennas. The antennas are listed in size order. So the in general, the smaller antennas are at the top and the bigger antennas are at the bottom. And I can already see there's some some uh, some differences there. Let me just, I think I can sort. I can do some sorting by size here. So these columns allow you to do sort. I mean, I could sort by description. It's not terribly helpful. Perhaps what's most helpful is if I support, if I uh, sort them by gain. You can see the one at the top, this integrated dual polarity antenna. Uh, oops, I just selected it. That one has a 23 dBi gain. So that's a healthy gain. Um, it's about a, a two foot antenna. And uh, that's the gain that we get with that antenna. Um, if we go bigger, 
what happens? Well, we'll get higher gain, bigger antennas. You've got more energy that you're focusing. Uh, so you can um, get more power to the receiver, get more power to Surfer Boy, if you will. Uh, but you have to be careful because, I mean, you can go crazy here. And I think we've got, yeah, we've got a 12-foot antenna. Now, last time I checked, most people were between uh, three and six feet, okay? Um, 12 feet, that's a huge antenna. And these antennas are very expensive and they're very hard to install. You have to pay somebody lots of money to go install these. So generally we don't use large antennas uh, so often. Uh, if the link were incredibly important, you know, if we had a public safety uh, data service that we needed to establish, you know, for uh, push to talk communications in an emergency like a hurricane or something, we might use a 12 foot dish. But typically we're gonna restrict ourselves to a little bit smaller dishes. So you can't go crazy. That's one of life's trade-offs that I was talking about. The bigger dishes are what? They're more expensive and they're harder to install. They may have bigger gains, so there's a big advantage, but they got a couple of disadvantages. So let's tell you what, let's, let's choose a three-foot antenna. And of course, we'll choose a Camden Networks three-foot antenna. And then over here, I can choose another three-foot antenna, the Camden Networks. And then, what am I seeing here? This is my transmit power. So this is the first part of the link budget we were talking about before. Transmit power, 20 dBm. And if you like, you can convert that to milliwatts and, and see how many milliwatts that is. This is the antenna gain right here of the transmitter, 31 and a half dBi. This would be your antenna gain of the receiver, 31 and a half dBi. Now, why don't I see the receive power over here? Well, that's because we put the transmit power over here and over here, and the receiver stuff goes down at the bottom. So the performance, that is the receive power at point B coming from point A, look at it over here, minus 36 dBm. And then you've got a little bit of a fudge factor here, plus or minus 5 dB. So that's my receive power, okay? Now, the astute among you will say, well, wait a minute, where is the free space path loss? Well, you gotta look in the middle, it's right here. So how do I figure this out? I take the transmit power, add the antenna gain, subtract the free space path loss, add the receiver gain, and I should get the predicted receiver power. Now there's some other differences in here, like there's some gaseous absorption loss, and perhaps some excess path loss. Take a look at that total path loss. That's what you really need to be concerned about. Now, what are some of the trade-offs real quickly? We've taken about 38 minutes to get here. I'm running out of time. We already talked about antenna size. And you know what we even forgot to enter our requirements in. Surfer Boy is gonna get 157 megabits per second each direction. And remember I told you he would be okay with four nines. This link will do, um, 157 megabits each way. So this is a hot, this is a fast link, all right? 157 megabits per second from point A to point B, and it'll do the same from point B to point A. What's the availability? In other words, how long will the link be down? Oh, look at that. It's gonna be unavailable for two and a half minutes a year in that direction. And in the lowest mode that it's in, um, it's 100% it's available, it won't go down. Theoretically, it's 100%, it still might go down. Now, what are some trade-offs here? You'll note that I've got high throughput here. Why is the throughput so high? Well, it's because the bandwidth I've chosen, the channel bandwidth is so large. So the Wi-Fi experts among you will say, ah, this looks familiar because Wi-Fi channels are 20 megahertz apart. And then if you do some channel bonding, you can get 40 megahertz or 80 megahertz or even 160 meg. This particular product has selectable bandwidth. So you can do five, 10, 15, 20, and so forth. And all that is, is shown up here. So what if we, what if we reduce the channel bandwidth? Um, what if we don't have that much bandwidth? Um, this is like the width of your highway. Um, a wide highway can carry lots of traffic, but what's the trade-off? Well, let's go take a look. 
Let's go take a look down here. Now you can see I've narrowed the channel. In fact, I've almost halved it. I more than halved it. So is that link going to be able to carry 157? Oh, no. In fact, if we look at this average throughput here, it's only going to carry about 100. So I better reduce that. The surfable is not going to be happy. So if I reduce my requirement to 100 megabits per second, now I'm happy again. Okay, I've got a good receive power, I've got a good availability, life is swell. But what have I really done? Well, by reducing this bandwidth, I've had to reduce the throughput. So that's another one of those trade-offs. High bandwidth, yeah, you're going to have high throughput. What's the, what's the drawback? Well, I'll tell you what, it's this thing called interference. This is unwanted radio frequency energy that might be in your channel. Because this is an unlicensed spectrum, other people might be transmitting in this spectrum at a relatively high power. And when we add that interference in, that takes away from uh, the link quality. And you can see what's happened here. I put in a what might be considered a typical value. Don't quote me on that, any of your experts. Um, if you want to know what the value of the interference is, you should go and measure it. Anyway, um, I put some interference in here, and you can see how it's reduced the availability. The wider the channel is, the more chance for uh, interference I can have. So you've got to be careful with that. Now, what are some other trade-offs that I have here? Ah, modulation mode. So watch what, I, watch what happens here. Um, what, are, what is a modulation mode? What you should do is think of this as gear shifting. And if you play around with it, you can see what's happening. In fact, let me get rid of the path profile here so you can see it. I'm going to get rid of the configuration. Um, take a look at my throughput right here. I'm letting this link run from the, from the highest modulation mode available to the lowest available. Well, what if I set it to the lowest? Okay, now I'm only allowed to go up to 16 qualm. And that's like, you know, third or fourth gear. All this is is a label for a gear. And you can see what's happened is my throughput has reduced, it's been decreased significantly. I was at 38. Well, what if I increase the modulation mode? Oh, it'll go up a little bit. There's 58, 64. Now I'm up to 69 megabits per second. And again, if I peg the fun meter and I go to 256 qualm, I'm back up to my 100 megabits per second. Now, this is if I limit the highest modulation mode. What if I limit the lowest? Well, and you can see what's happening here as well. I've got a lot, a lot of other options. What am I really doing there? Well, this, in a nutshell, is going to affect your availability. That is the trade-off, all right? So think of it this way. You're in your, your, mom, in your mom's Porsche and you're driving down the highway, and you're driving down the highway in sixth gear. You're probably going upwards of 75 to 85 miles an hour, which is a very dangerous thing to do, especially considering you might not be old enough to drive. In any case, it's a high gear. You are going fast. What are the risks of going fast? Well, hey, you're going to run into something. The risk is you're not going to stay alive. So what do you do? Well, you downshift. You go to a lower gear. So now you're driving your mom's Porsche 911 in first gear. How fast are you going? Well, okay, let's just forget about the fact that you can go really fast in first gear as well. Let's say you're going probably 10 to 15 miles an hour. Now it's a lot safer. If you're driving 10 to 15 miles an hour, you'll have a lot more reaction time to not run into things. When you're going really, really fast, you can't respond um, sometimes quickly enough and you might run into something. Whereas if you're driving very slowly, you have time to respond. Now, is this what the radio is actually doing? By all means, it is not. It is not reacting or responding. But the analogy is similar. If I run at a high modulation mode, my availability may be affected. The link may have a higher chance of going down if I run at a higher modulation mode. If I set it at a lower modulation mode, like HPSK or BPSK or QPSK, some of these lower modulation modes, um, the link will have, in general, all things being equal, 
will have a higher availability. And remember, we're trying to keep that link up so that Surfer Boy is not annoyed at us when the link goes down. It's all about availability. So the trade-off here is, in general, all things being equal, high modulation mode, those links, when you run them at high modulation mode, typically have a lower availability than if you run at a lower modulation mode. So lower modulation mode typically means higher availability. So let's look at some other trade-offs. What other trade-offs are those supposed to talk about? Oh, oh, antenna height. Antenna height. Let me show you that one. We already talked about antenna size. Let's look at antenna height. Watch what happens if I drop these down to 50 feet at each end. Now I've probably got something that's in the way. This blue um, ellipsoid or oval, I need to keep that free if I want the best link performance. Now some of our products will work in what's called non-line of sight or near line of sight. I'm not gonna cover that. Uh, suffice to say that a lot of products, you need a full line of sight here. This just shows you uh, where, where this area has to be kept free. Now watch what happens. If I go to a much, much lower frequency, that oval gets a lot bigger. So there's a trade-off here. If I have a lower frequency band, then I'm gonna have a bigger, and this is called a Fresnel zone. And that area has to be kept clear. If I use a real high band, 38, notice how the Fresnel zone, that oval or that ellipsoid gets much, much smaller. Now, keep in mind the way this is drawn here is, <laughs> this distance is measured in miles and this one is measured in feet. So this is a very distorted picture. This is really not, it looks like a cigar or a hot dog. It's not, it's more like a piece of linguine that's fat in the middle and thinner at the ends. So it's a form of spaghetti, again, thicker in the middle and uh, thinner or narrower at the ends. So that's one of the trade-offs. Now remember, um, let's take a look at the free space path trade-off, free space path loss trade-off. So now I'm at 38 gig, and this is very specific. I'm at 38 gig. Look at my free space path loss here. It's 133 dB, okay? What if I change bands? I go back to the 5.8. So let's remember the number 133.55. So 133, roughly. Go down to 5.8. Oh, look at that. The loss has decreased. So there's another trade-off. If I have a higher frequency band, say 38 gigahertz, my loss is about 133 dB for this particular link. If I have a lower frequency band, like 5.8 gigahertz, my loss goes down to 116 dB. So it's a much lower loss. What if I drop it? I mean, let's just peg the front. Let's go to the other end. What if I go down to 900 megahertz or 0.9 gig? Oh, look at that, I'm down to 109 dB of, of loss. So that's much, much lower than what I started out with at 38. All right. And again, this is just for this particular link. Link Planner helps you calculate this for every link in your system. What are some other trade-offs? Oh, antenna heights. Antenna heights, what if I lower them even further? to the point where I've got something in the way. Now, some of our products will actually, this link will actually close and I will get throughput. Uh, at 5.8, this link will close. It says non-line of sight, so let's look. What is my power here? Oh, my power, see, it's pretty low, minus 71. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put a bigger antenna on it. Let's just put six feet antennas on it. Six footers are reasonable. Now look at that, our power is back up to minus 44. Now, my link is still complaining, though. It's, it's not able to do 100, so I'd have to tell Surfer Boy, look, it's only going to do 50. Now, what if he were okay with 50? In fact, let's just, what's he accustomed to at home? He's probably accustomed to 30. That's what I'm talking to you on right now is 30 megabits per second down. So right now I'm looking at an availability of 98. That's not a very high availability, is it? 
So that would be unavailable for six days a year. And again, not six consecutive days, but throughout the year, that time period, it would in all likelihood be down. So what else could we do? Well, <laughs> the way to fix that would be to raise the antennas because the objects are in the way or ask Ikea to move or ask Motorola to move. I mean, sometimes the solution is a chainsaw, tear the tree down. We don't, we don't like that. That's not a preferred solution, but sometimes that happens. So let's say we can afford to raise our antenna and but you know what, let's just try 75 at each end. Let's see if that solves our problem. I think it does. I have to go back to where we started. Yeah, go back to where we started from. So that's the effect that the antenna height has. It's got to be high enough to clear the terrain. Sometimes, well, depending on how much you're, avail uh, you're able to play with this, sometimes you'll find that when you get just close enough to the Earth, you can actually improve the performance of a link. Um, and that's kind of an advanced topic that I'm not going to talk about right now. What are some other features of this, this link planning tool? Um, you can go crazy with it. You can create uh, networks. Let's go back and look at our networks. You can use this tool not just to do one link, but a, a combination of links. So let's look at that. Let's see. Oh, we've talked about all that. We talked about that. There's my network page. There it is. Sorry. So these are screenshots from real networks that we have used link planner to plan. Now, what do I have here? I have uh, a tandem, a tandem. Some of you might be familiar with the tandem bicycle. That's a bicycle built for two. What is this? This is a network built for two. This is two links, one link, two links. Another way that I can configure links is I could run them in parallel. So what if Surfer Boy were really demanding and he didn't sleep at all? What if he had to have internet 24 hours a day and he just never slept? He might want to have two links in parallel because the likelihood, the probability that both of those links would go down at the same time is just so small, it would, it would, it would probably never happen. And so if he had two links that were well designed, they would stay up and uh, he would never see a network outage. And that is another network topology that I haven't put on here because, I mean, we can plan it in Link Planner, but it's not very meaningful. It just looks like a single link, and it's actually two. Um, notice that in this tandem scenario here, both of those links have to be up for the entire network to be up. In a parallel configuration or topology, only one of them has to be up for the, the network to be connected. Now, this is called a star topology, and you just have a central location. Let's say that's where my internet is coming from, and I want to get it out to these locations. That is a star configuration. And then this is a ring configuration. So if I'm trying to get, you know, again, I have a source of internet here. That internet can get over here through two different paths. And so you can see how this is like a parallel link. I've got two different directions I can go. And so this is increasing my availability. The likelihood that this guy is not going to have service is very low because there are two paths. What about over here? Oh, see, each one of these only has one. So if you need something that's highly available, typically you're going to go with a ring topology and not a star topology. What are the drawbacks? Well, what if the guys at, the, at these endpoints are all manic game players? They love video games. Video games require very low latency, at least a lot of them do. And this, this has the lowest latency. What is latency? That is a delay in sending the signal from point A to point B. And so a star network is going to have low latency, whereas look at this. If I'm going to get from here to there, I have to go one, two, three, four hops. So I'm going to have to survive. You know, it's going to take some time. It's going to take four times the amount of time uh, to get here as it is here in all likelihood. Now, again, longer links are going to have longer latency, so I'm not taking that into account. But in any case, the, the ring topology typically has a longer latency, so sometimes we need to be concerned about that. Okay, i got to close out here. Ray's going to stop me. What if you want to know more? Well, these are three excellent books 
that I have used. Now, I happen to have advanced engineering degrees, and so these books for me are just the best. They're great. Um, if you are in high school or if you have not had any college training, you might find them too advanced. However, I will warn you, there's not a lot of calculus in here. It's mostly um, decibel math um, and some addition and subtraction and a lot of, especially in the first book, a lot of um, common, well, not common sense, but a lot of um, experience, let's say, and a lot of information about how microwave transmission networks are deployed and how they're used. And so it is an engineering textbook, but it has a lot of um, has a lot of experiential information in it. So you know, don't be afraid to, to, to get that book and have a look at it. I've also outlined some Wikipedia pages that you can look at if you need to know or if you're curious, uh, you know, if you want to know more about this particular topic. Um, we've already talked about the high availability. You can learn more about uh, microwave and point-to-point -point links in, in this particular page right here for microwave transmission. This will tell you uh, more about decibels above a milliwatt. Oh, look, there's that link budget. What else have I got here? Uh, there's some wave stuff. Um, directional antenna is a good one. Um, you can also search for AT&T long lines. Uh, that will give you some history of microwave transmission. And that's pretty much it. Do we have any questions, Ray? No, we don't. We don't have any questions in the queue, Dave. Uh, I guess the, the takeaway thought that I've got is that it's really all about that link budget uh, calculation. And the, uh, the great thing about Link Planner is that it lets you visualize whether it's height of the antenna, whether it's the size of the antenna, whether it's the frequency uh, and also the channel width, it lets you visually see what effect those have on length. Exactly, exactly. Great, well, thank you very much, Dave, and thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, the uh, presentation has been recorded, so we will be posting that to the community sometime tomorrow. Uh, along with the slides, we'll post the PDF of those as well. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, you can certainly post them on the community and we'll get back to you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.